All right, Dirk, first and foremost, thank you uh, for joining us uh, on GoOpen. It's pretty much a pioneering show in the world uh, with regards to open source technology. Thank you so much. Thanks. You don't need much of an introduction when it comes to the world of, uh, of techies and, you know, and people who are involved in the Internet and computers. You're pretty much a legend to them. But to the average man on the street, why have you affected their lives so very much? Right, so, so basically what we do is I belong to a, to a group of people and I mean there are over like a thousand in the Apache Software Foundation today and what we like started doing some 10 years ago was basically build the sort of like first web servers. So whenever you go like on the internet and you go to a website uh, to book an airline ticket, to order a book, to look at a newspaper and there's a piece of software there which sort of like hands you the page. So whenever your, your web browser, your computer is fetching a page, there's a piece of software which gives you that page on the side of the company. So it's, then these pieces of software are like located um, at, at newspaper companies, at airline companies. And that piece of software basically was written by a, by a group of people, myself included, uh, called the Apache Software Foundation. Now let's talk more about the Apache Software Foundation. Obviously uh, one of the earliest adopters of using an open source methodology. Um, how has it grown through that? Basically, at various places around the world, there were people, uh, myself included, who basically had a, were given a task by their bosses, by their institutions, to basically maintain a web server. In my case, basically, my boss wanted me to uh, make satellite pictures available, uh, weather pictures available to scientists. Uh, colleagues of mine in the U.S. were basically trying to make uh, newspapers available, magazines available, online shops available. And for quite a while, that actually worked really rather well. Except that at one point, uh, Rob McCool, uh, who was well, like one of the main developers at NCSA in America, left to form Netscape. And all of a sudden, there was this web server piece of software, which we all depended on for our jobs, uh, which our companies depended on, or in my case, the European Commission, the, the, the government and depended on, suddenly was left out there orphaned. So what started to happen was that we sort of like started to collaborate together to maintain that piece of software, to make it better, to basically make it need sort of like our like daily demands. And that sort of like grew on and on and on. Uh, for actually quite a few years. That basically became the Apache web server at one point. Um, since then, basically, and this was like about like 10 years ago, since then um, it's no longer just a web server. It also like things were added like the XML um, document language, um, basically bits to do e-commerce, uh, bits of code to like, for example, make your bank system talk securely uh, to your credit card system. Um, so over time, so like we've grown from like just like 10 people to like over a thousand uh, uh, today. How popular is the uh, Apache server? Um, so Basically, so originally, like when we started, there was actually only the, the, the CERN server from the original. So the, the, the World Wide Web sort of like originated from, from CERN in Switzerland. Um, and with it came a very like small server, which was only really suitable to be run on, on mainframes at that time. Um, since then, basically, we've sort of like grown from like being just a few percent to like well over like 70 percent of the, of the web servers in the world. Um, and so sort of like even like the second biggest sort of like is about like 20 percent and, and 10 percent. Um, and it's not just sort of like big in like terms of numbers. Uh, specifically, if you go to like the very large super sites like Yahoo, like Amazon, um, those are typically the sites which run the Apache web server. So if you actually look on the wire, if you look at like the number of pages being served by Apache or the, the amount of bandwidth Apache basically uses worldwide, uh, the numbers are even higher than that 70%. But now, what is the importance of standards when it comes to web servers and web software? Well, so the, the reason basically we, we probably grew that large was not because we are sort of like a, the, the very best or the fastest one or the most secure server, because there were other people sort of like, uh, like vying for that claim. It's just the fact that um, whenever you, you have like your web browser, you basically want to be able to talk to like anyone's web server. So when you actually go to like a, a South African newspaper or an English one or a German one or, or a, a Russian one, basically you want to make sure that your PC can actually fetch a page from there. So it's kind of like vitally important that everyone in the world sort of like speaks the same language, sort of like uses the same way of actually sort of like sending that web page from their sort of like corporate server down to your PC at home. So what really happened here is that um, Apache just sort of like happened to be one of the most standards compliance uh, server. And in fact, what was really happening was that while the standards were being formed, we were writing the code. And as we write the code, we sort of like said to the people writing the standards, well, actually, that's not really implementable. Can you kind of like change the standard a little bit this way or that way? So we sort of like ended up being sort of like the sort of like Tower of Babel or sort of the most neutral, uh, perhaps Esperanto of, of all those um, uh, servers. Um, and what sort of like happened is that, that now in the industry, um, if you actually want to talk to anyone else, you really want to sort of like use the same language, exactly the same implementation. And the easiest way you can do that is actually by using the same software. So we're sort of like popular by, yeah, the, the, the reason we're so popular basically was caused by the fact that 
Um, everyone like tries to be as, as compatible as possible, and yeah, you're ultimately the most compatible if you all use the same software. Um, and that's sort of like what drives us, the fact that basically all these web servers around the internet are trying to be, trying to be interoperable with, with each other, trying to be sort of like speak the same language with each other, and that's why ultimately most of the larger sites are, are basically using the same software. If you want to like, like have an analogy, basically think of like the fax machine. There is no benefit to actually buy a fax machine which speaks like a different language, because then you can't send fax to half of the world. So ultimately, everyone also like wants to have the same fax machine, which will like send the same sort of pages. We are sort of like that bottom boring piece of software, which yeah, basically everyone is, has the same software of. Uh, in the beginning, your ability with Apache to host more than one site on a server was a big selling point with regards to Apache. Right. So what was happening in, in the early days of the, of, of the web is that um, the original servers, I mean, if they could handle like one connection, one, one client sort of like per minute, that was really a lot. And it was very hard to sort of like keep it because the web was growing very, very quickly. So what happened was that in, in the Apache community, you would only add those bits of codes, code you would really, really need. There was a lot of work to do. So you would typically only sort of choose those bits which directly sort of like you needed for your daily work. The result of that was that um, we sort of like in the Apache code typically added those things which most people like needed most desperately. And one of them was, for example, like the multi-hosting, being able to run multiple web servers off one expensive machine. Uh, because at that time it was, um, um, yeah, the cheap machines like Linux, et cetera, didn't really exist yet. So being able to run more, web, more than one web server off this sort of like very expensive machine was a, was a very important thing for, for basically our, uh, for ourselves essentially. So we're not like trying to, like, like a company, like trying to write for customers. We're really like creating the web server which we ourselves and our businesses needed. And somehow obviously like being driven to like by daily need means that your server sort of like really works very well in the real world. Um, as opposed to some of the commercial servers which are like basically we're more driven with a certain company or a certain segment of the market uh, in mind. Now, one of the most amazing things about your company is that uh, the Apache software is available free for download. Yeah, so actually, like, I'll, I'll, I'll basically take some offense, like, basically, for the worth uh, company there. I mean, basically, the Apache Software Foundation is, is actually, like, two things. It's the Apache community, so this is kind of like a community, sort of like a quarter of a million people out there who, who work with the Apache server on a daily basis, who, who, who contribute code, who contribute patches, who, who help us refine and polish it. And, and on the other hand, there's the Apache Software Foundation, which is sort of like the legal, uh, the rather boring entity, which basically has the copyright on the code, which, which sort of like uh, maintains some servers, uh, which works with lawyers in the areas of patents and copyrights and trademarks. Um, so, so really, the Apache community as a whole is sort of like nothing more than just like a collection of people who, who need that web server on a, on a daily basis. How does the Apache organization generate income? There are basically like over a thousand developers which work on the Apache code on a daily basis. And they do that for all sorts of reasons. Um, some of them work for very large companies like IBM, Sun, Oracle, Microsoft. And some of them work just for like one person consulting outfits. And basically what they do together, they all sort of like have in their daily life, uh, they have a certain like need or desire. Um, there are also like a few like people who do it purely as a hobby, hobby, but those people are actually more rare. But what all these people sort of like have in common that they need this web technology, this internet technology uh, in their daily life for their, their customers. And in each case, um, it's very important, it's vitally important for each of those people that whatever system they build for customer A can talk to whatever they build for customer B or what someone else builds for customer C. And ultimately, the easiest way to make sure that your systems talk to other people's systems if you all sort of like use the same basic code, so if you make sure that the same bottom layer is the same, effectively if you all like use the same yeah, material, so to speak. And so that is why a lot of people, a lot of companies, basically let their employees uh, work on Apache code, uh, donate their time freely, because what that does, it basically builds a bottom layer of, of software, of software infrastructure, which basically works with other people's in infrastructure. Essentially, you could look at it sort of like as the equivalent of like building a road system. And not, I mean, big companies are not going to build their own road system. Ultimately, you just want to, to connect to the, yeah, the world's road system. And that's what's happening in the software world as well. We basically spend time to basically build systems which are so common that other people can use it as well, which means that the system we built for our customers will work with other customers as well. So basically our customers get a system which they can use to talk to their bank, to their insurance company, to their travel agents, and not, you don't sort of like get a balkanized world. You basically get like one world which, well, well, one interconnected world, one internet. What is your whole feel with regards to open source and the future in that? There, there are a, a couple of answers possible to them. And I think one thing is basically, I have to disappoint you there, or basically disappoint people who are looking in the Apache Software Foundation sort of like for people on a mission who really want to evangelize open source in the world. Most people in the Apache Foundation um, are actually not quite like that. They're sort of like, 
they typically have like real jobs, real customers, um, who just have like demands. And they found that the cheapest way or the, the highest quality way or some other compromise um, way of actually serving their customers is by using open source software and collaborating by others. Because simply, if you're a big company or if you're a small company, if you can sort of like build a certain stuff for a sec together rather than alone, that's often cheaper. And if you're like trying to talk to other people, there's typically no real commercial benefit of making your stack very unique because then you can't talk to others anymore. So it's very sort of like um, cost effective to build the part where you talk to each other and have that part of the code basically you build that together. And so that's what you see happening in the Apache Software Foundation, in the Apache world, that most people are simply there because it's, it makes sense to build software together. And I think that's actually like one of the driving forces um, where you basically see open source being used in very large companies, um, in the government, in all sorts of places, that it just basically makes sense from a, from a social and, and commercial perspective. Having said that, um, there is also a certain um, aesthetic beauty to it, sort of like a certain pleasure to basically be able to like see what, 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 what very bright people have built and be able to sort of like build on top of that. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel again. So there's also like something you get back from yeah, being able to work with very, very bright people and sort of like leverage what they have written to actually build something even nicer, something even more beautiful. Um, but I think in the Apache Software Foundation, and, and that's definitely not true for the whole open source world, but just for that segment of the open source world, um, it just makes commercial sense just as much as it is a, a pleasure. It's, it's fun to work with other people. With all pros also come cons. What threats do you foresee the internet will face in the future? So, so there, there are various things, uh, there are various uh, pressures right now on, on open source and, and open standards uh, just as much. Um, of, obviously, there are like the various legal pressures within the Apache Software Foundation specifically. Um, that's actually one of the things we spent most of our time doing in, in the past like, like 10 years to basically learn how you deal with commercial pressure, financial pressure, uh, legal pressure. So unlike a lot of other parts in open source, we've actually spent a lot of time on making sure that we've documented every line of code. So whenever you show us a line of code from the Apache Software Foundation, we can tell you who wrote it, who changed it, who they were employed by, and what basically gives us the right or the copyright or the trademark or whatever is needed to deal with that piece of code. Um, but that's sort of like not everything. Um, I think the biggest risk for open source is um, that a few of the large, uh, very powerful industries or perhaps very powerful countries um, at one point will basically invent their own language and close that. So right now, you can use the same web browser, the same web server, anywhere on the internet. Whether you're in China, in America, in South Africa, it doesn't matter. Everything can talk to everything, and everyone can basically use the same language there. And of course, there is always a risk that at some point, um, a certain area of the internet sort of like starts to speak their, speak their private language. And for example, if you look back very early on in the, in the mobile phone world, if you look at, for example, at WAP, you saw examples of, of sort of like walled gardens when suddenly like a part of the, yeah, the network wasn't sort of like connected to the rest of the internet. And I think that's one of the, yeah, the, the biggest threats for, for open source and open standard that suddenly like a, yeah, a private standard like takes over. If that would happen, what would in essence happen to the freedom and, and users worldwide on the internet? Well, I think basically what it basically puts users in and also like companies in like a bit of a nasty position um, because they, they may actually be forced to like take an either or choice. Do I talk to, to this crowd or do I talk to that crowd? So you basically get a certain level of balkanization. I think at the same time, that's also the mitigator for that risk because ultimately it makes no sense to split. I mean, if you're a company, you're not going to like talk to one half at, of the world at the expense of the other half of the world because I mean, if you can talk to the whole world, that just makes more sense. I mean, there are like no two fax machine standards in the world. Um, so I think gradually um, this sort of like internet sort of like open standards will, will sort of like win. And if you look at like what a lot of like uh, European governments are doing right now, they're making open standards uh, yeah, a very important part of their policy and very, very important part of the infrastructure more and more because they realize there is this risk of, of balkanization, risk of sort of like splitting the world in two parts. Where do you see Apache uh, being? in the next five years? Apache is like really like two things. It's a community of people who basically work together on code. And it's not just people, it's also a community of, of companies who, who buy code, who sell code, who modify the code. So there's basically a whole ecosystem around Apache. That's one side of Apache. The other side of Apache is a, is a legal guardian, basically a, a steward of code. Um, and that actually, that part of Apache is rather boring. Um, it basically deals with legal things, financial things, and basically it's a, yeah, a repository for code. I see that second part um, maturing a little bit more. Uh, we're learning um, a lot about uh, legal threats, about financial threats to code, um, and basically 
improving our, our procedures. One of the recent things we started to do is something called the incubator. So when we accept a new project, when, because basically people come to it actually quite regular, like several times a month with, with new codes they want to make open source through the Apache uh, Software Foundation. Um, we basically are learning how to do that in a more efficient way, in a more secure way, basically in a, in a way which um, allows big companies to sort of like use that, that software safe of lawsuits and, and, and other issues. So I see basically like, like a further improvement, refinement of that process of the documentation you're doing there, of the legal vetting you're doing. On the ecosystem side of things, um, what we see right now today is we see some very, very large companies using Apache like IBM, Sun, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, BEA, the very big ones in this world, and we see a lot of like very small companies doing that. And I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years is that middle segment to actually like discover Apache and actually discover um, that that's something, yeah, they can basically build better things for their customers with. Um, so that's, I think, yeah, a, a new thing happening there. Apart from that, I'm not actually expecting, yeah, the Apple, Apple car to be upset very much. It's sort of like it will slowly grow. Um, it will actually, and that's actually something which, which may be a worry of things. Um, over the last, like, 10 years, we've seen Apache sort of, like, grow almost linearly. So we basically, we become bigger and bigger, whereas the Internet grows exponentially. So as time goes on, there are actually like proportionally less people working on open source basically as the Internet grows. So we're basically lagging behind on the growth of the Internet. Um, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, that's like something for anthropologists to, to look at, but it's definitely an interesting effect that we're sort of like, even though we're one of the largest, if not the largest open source organization on the Internet, we grow slower than the Internet itself is growing. Are there any uh, tricks up the Apache's organization sleeve uh, with regards to what's going to happen in the Internet in the future? Well, I think not, not tricks. There is one, one thing which is very much core to our existence, and that is that we really value that code, that basically work we've created uh, lasts very long, like last five years, 10 years, 50 years. So one of the tricks we've we found in doing this, and actually making sure that code lives beyond sort of like the original creators, is actually making sure that there are like no uh, personal babies, sort of like no personal things. So whenever we get an open source project contributed to us, we first look at it. Is this actually like a, a product of one person or actually of, of a community? And is there like a long-term viable community with that? And very often that does mean that we try to um, make sure there is no like single individual who, who basically places his own interest like above that of the community. And we basically try to make sure that the product is, is one of the community as, the whole, as a whole. The proliferation of uh, mobile handheld devices, is that not perhaps going to cause an additional burden or strain onto the Internet? There are like many more like devices like coming, out, coming onto the Internet. Uh, mobile phones is, is, is one good example. The other, the other good example is basically uh, light switches, TV sets. I mean, basically, it, it, it goes on and on. And that's one of the reasons why like, IPv6 is rather crucial to sort of like keep up with that sort of demand. But from the, let's say, Apache side, from the server side, uh, no, that's actually a very natural thing to do. And, and obviously the systems will get, get larger and larger. Um, but I, I wouldn't really expect any, any worries there. Um, I do see uh, in the Apache Software Foundation um, a lot of proliferation of, of a lot of addition of um, a projects which are not no longer dealing with just like talking to people. So, for example, web servers typically like just talk to individuals. They talk to people and they send them like a web page of a newspaper or of, a, of an advert or of a, some, some airline booking. What we do see, and that's actually something which is important for mobile devices, for lots of other things, is this new semantic web where basically devices are talking to devices. So my phone actually like talks to my computer at home to actually figure out if, if something is scheduled or not. Um, and that's actually a different type of, of software and we see some of the more recent additions of the Apache Software Foundation actually be software of that type. So software which is no longer about like a, a computer talking to a human, but actually computers talking to each other to like deal with logistics, deal with planning, uh, deal with, with various sort of like yeah, inter-business uh, things. In a nutshell, what exactly is IPv6 and how will it be seen in the next five okay. years? So, so right now on the internet we're using something called IPv4. And obviously there was like IPv1, 2, and 3, but they were never in popular use. IPv4 basically means there is a, every computer, every device, every phone on the internet sort of like has like a 12-digit a phone number. What IPv6 does is actually really rather simple. Instead of like having a 12-digit phone number, we're basically going to like a 40, 50-digit phone number. That basically means there are more possible phone numbers, so there are basically more possible devices. And the reason for that is, is rather plain and simple. 
with the sort of 12 digits we have today, um, we basi we're basically running out of digits. Um, so that's basically why we're going to these longer phone numbers. Um, the other thing which IPv6 does, which is a, a secondary important, is that it actually gives us a little bit of more security, a little bit of more confidentiality, and a little bit better privacy. Uh, but the main reason is we basically need like extra digits in the, in the computer their phone numbers. When do you see IPv6 support coming in? Right. So, so right now, today, um, Apache has actually supported, thanks to um, a group of people in Japan, Apache has actually supported IPv6 for like some four or five years now. Um, and we actually get feedback on that IPv6 support. We actually get people like finding that actually this doesn't work or that can be improved. So we do know that IPv6 is actually used with Apache uh, worldwide uh, by people. And we also see, uh, specifically in the larger telecom world, um, uh, people like slowly moving to IPv6. And we also see um, some large governments uh, mandating IPv6. For example, the, uh, the US military and the European military it basically will not buy um, a computer project, a product unless it supports IPv6. And that rule has been in effect for almost a year now. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. It basically, it will get there. I'm personally very surprised it's taking this long. Uh, we're using it inside my own private company actually quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I think it, it'll eventually get there. Um, obviously, yeah, these things take time, and surprisingly, they take more time than I expected. Dirk, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. From all of us, you have a wonderful day. All right. See you guys.